I'll give a little readout about the, the foundation in a bit, uh, but let me first introduce uh, um, Professor Michael Van Walt, the, who's going to, whose book is going to be discussed today. I had the pleasure of reading this uh, till last weekend, and it was a wonderful insight and a great and a very fascinating narrative of, of the history of Tibet in a context uh, which is, uh, you know, new to a lot of us. And I think it's a very timely and very significant piece of, uh, of uh, work which has come out in a scholarly uh, a work which has come out at, at a time like this when uh, uh, I think uh, Tibet and, and India's national security interests uh, are of paramount importance uh, to all of us here. Uh, I think so the uh, format we will do is that I will uh, just make a very quick uh, introduction of, of the FNVA. Mm -hmm start with and then uh, hand it over uh, to Ambassador Sham Saram, who's kindly agreed to chair this and moderate this session. Uh, we couldn't have got a better uh, set of experts uh, today on this panel. Uh, so uh, let me start with FNVA is a non-profit uh, organization which is actually focusing on uh, Tibet and China. We do a lot of uh, research related work on, on Tibet. And the highlights uh, that we have had uh, since the inception in 2009 uh, was the 2011 event where we talked about the regional dialogue series on, uh, and there we focused on ecology and environment and the impact of these uh, factors on India's security as well as the regional security in this area. In 2011, we had, uh, I think, uh, one of the most important uh, events that, uh, of, of the time where we, are, we talked about uh, transboundary river water. Uh, it was a conference for the first time, I think, in this part of the world. We had Chinese scholars, Tibetan scholars, and Indian scholars in one room uh, talking about very freely and candidly about uh, this particular subject. We, had, uh, we also prepared in 2013 an appraisal of India's uh, Tibet policy uh, with giving in some recommendations based on a very intense discussions and insights uh, by leading scholars, by diplomats and senior government officials and strategic affairs experts on this particular aspect. And I think it was very well received by the decision makers of the time. Uh, we are in the process of actually making a reappraisal of this policy. You know, it's seven years down and many things have happened. So we're going to visit that uh, very soon. And uh, we also did a project uh, on uh, Tibet's relations with the Himalayas, which is a two-year project, which, uh, which was uh, led by Professor Siddhid Bahid. Uh, it was also uh, uh, very well received and a very insightful uh, study about, uh, about Tibet uh, and, and its relationship with the Himalayan region. Uh, since the COVID uh, times, we have moved to a virtual platform. We've had a series of uh, discussions and webinars on Tibet and different aspects of Tibet, uh, where uh, uh, Professor uh, Michael has, uh, Van Walt has uh, contributed immensely. Uh, these were talking about uh, Tibet today, the reaffirmation of the status of Tibet. Uh, we talked about uh, international support for Tibet. We talked about how uh, and different aspects of Tibet. So let me not go into each and every detail of this, but it was uh, you know, a series of things. And today uh, we are on this uh, very, very important subject. Now, uh, without uh, further ado, uh, I think people know the, the speakers. I think each one of them are aware. Uh, Ambassador Sham Saran, as everybody knows, I don't think uh, he needs any kind of introduction, former foreign secretary and a, and a very respected, at least in my, uh, in my life, uh, I've seen some of the most outstanding diplomats that he has been and such, a, uh, such an insightful, such a frank and open uh, views uh, that he expresses about uh, various subjects. We have Lieutenant General Narsiman, who is a member of the National Security Advisory Board, again, a great expert on China. Uh, we have uh, uh, Palki Sharma Upadhyay, who is, uh, I think everybody knows, we were just talking about it a little while ago, that uh, voice streams into everybody's home and office uh, every day and talking about China and save several subjects. Uh, we have uh, Komodo Vasan from the Ch Chennai Center for Chinese Studies. Uh, so we have, a, we have a stellar panel. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let me hand over the floor to Ambassador Sham Saran to kindly conduct the proceedings. Uh, he would be chairing and moderating. So over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Krishan, for that very generous uh, introduction. And may I extend a very warm welcome 
uh, to both our um, main speaker uh, as well as all our distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, it is a great uh, privilege for me to have uh, uh, this opportunity to chair this uh, session, which will be focusing on really a remarkable uh, book that has been uh, uh, published by uh, Michael van Wart, uh, who is an international lawyer, he's a mediator, uh, he has been involved in many uh, peace processes, um, he is also someone who has done a great deal of work on international uh, law, international legal issues, and uh, he has also been uh, a legal advisor to uh, His Holiness uh, the Dalai Lama uh, as uh, well as to the Central uh, Tibet Administration. Uh, so this is the book that he has written, uh, Tibet Brief, uh, 20... Uh, Sorry? Uh, I would, may I request uh, the uh, others who are attending to please mute themselves because that will interfere otherwise with the proceedings. Uh, so, as I was saying, um, uh, the author Michael van Wart uh, has a very uh, distinguished uh, career as uh, an international lawyer, and uh, he has uh, produced this uh, this uh, remarkable uh, book. Uh, which is uh, Tibet Brief uh, 2020, which has recently uh, been uh, published. And uh, it really sort of unpacks uh, the uh, legal issues surrounding uh, Tibet, its uh, status, uh, particularly in terms of, you know, the history of Tibet and its relationship with China, not only relationship with China, but uh, throughout history, its relationship, for example, with the Mongols, where with the Manchus, uh, with the British uh, at a later period, uh, the whole aspect of, you know, whether uh, China had sovereignty over Tibet or whether it had suzerainty over Tibet. Uh, so he has done a, a, a remarkable job in really uh, sort of, as I said, unpacking many of these uh, issues. So what I will do is I will uh, request uh, Michael uh, to please uh, talk about his uh, book and what it's all about. Uh, but I would request him to please limit his remarks to about 40 minutes uh, uh, so that, you know, we have enough time to give to the other panelists to express their opinions, their views uh, on uh, what uh, Michael has uh, produced. So without any further ado, may, uh, Michael, may I request you to please make your presentation? You have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, um, I'd like to thank the Foundation for Nonviolent Alternatives for this uh, this invitation um, and for organizing um, this webinar. In particular, Raymond Banerjee Dar, uh, Mr. O.P. Tandon. Um, I would like to thank Mr. Uh, Krishnan Varma for the introduction. Uh, and for your kind words, and, and I wish to thank Ambassador Shyam Saran for chairing this panel, and again for um, uh, for your kind words. It's really an honor to be in your presence uh, um, and to share this platform with, with the extraordinary distinguished members um, of this panel. Let me perhaps kick off by formulating the crux of the matter before us today um, as I view it. China has occupied Tibet against the will of the Tibetan people for nearly three generations now. Its sovereignty claim to Tibet has no legal basis and rests solely on a self-serving historical narrative. This narrative is sinocentric, part inaccurate, and highly misleading. But it is so persistently and forcefully pushed by Beijing that the world has gradually bought into it and today largely treats them as China's internal affair, beyond its purview. We've become passive bystanders to an unfolding tragedy, and as a result of our government's appeasement on Tibet, China has become an entitled bully aggressively pursuing 
strategic territorial expansion elsewhere. And this is, in essence, the wrong I hope we can uh, address today and explore today. The world has grown largely silent on Tibet. Governments are self-censoring to accommodate Beijing's self-proclaimed sensitivities in the hope that this will serve their own interests. This includes the government of India. I would like to challenge the distinguished members of the panel today to take a hard look at the implications of not actively countering Beijing's historical narrative on Tibet. The narrative that alleges that Tibet has always been a part of China. The narrative that is the sole argument put forth by Beijing to support its claim to sovereignty over Tibet today does not actively countering Beijing's historical narrative on Tibet really serve India's interest today? And I'm putting this out there for us to consider during the panel discussion. But first, for those in the audience in particular who may not have read my book, um, and before we turn more specifically to India, let me briefly elaborate on the PRC's narrative and why leaving it unaddressed is detrimental to chances of resolving the Sino-Tibetan conflict. According to Beijing's narrative, Tibet has been part of the Chinese multinational state since antiquity. In an attempt to legitimize the PRC's current borders, the government in essence projects today's Chinese state with its current expansive territory into the past, together with modern concepts of territorial statehood and sovereignty. And in the process, it retroactively appropriates foreign empires, most importantly, the Mongol and Manchu Qing empires, designating them as Chinese and as China. The Mongol and Qing empires were of course not Chinese. They were both Inner Asian. They were Mongol and they were Manchu respectively. And their rulers conquered, occupied, and ruled China and the Chinese for centuries as part of their vast dominions. Both exercised authority way beyond the Chinese populated territories and extended their reach to the Tibetan plateau. But retroactively appropriating these foreign empires and with it their territorial scope and reach as Chinese, the PRC has laid the foundation for its argument that it simply inherited sovereignty over Tibet from its predecessors. Unfortunately, this narrative is not just for the history books. Beijing actively uses this narrative. Firstly, it has made negotiations with the Tibetans dependent on the Dalai Lama publicly accepting it. Secondly, it is putting a lot of pressure on all governments not to contradict the narrative. Beijing knows that it has no legitimacy to rule Tibet, that it simply took Tibet by force and has created this narrative to solve that problem. If the world believes it, the PRC's mission will have been accomplished. The first step is not to allow any contradiction of it. And this is where we are today, self-censoring and largely silent. Now, Mick Boltius and I wrote this book to break this silence. Silence and, af silence and absence of effective opposition to this narrative will over time turn into acquiescence, to buying into Beijing's narrative. That, I'm convinced, will make any effort to resolve the Sino-Tibetan conflict fruitless. And this is the main concern we try to address in this book. For negotiations to have a chance, the world needs to be aware of the true nature of the conflict. And that has everything to do with the nature of historical relations Tibet had with Asian neighbors and with the question 
whether Tibet was or was not historically a part of China. Careful historical examination reveals that Tibet was in fact historically never a part of China. Now, this does not mean that Tibet was always an independent state in the modern sense of the term. To be sure, Tibet's relations with the Mongol, Manchu, and British empires entailed different forms of dependency. But none of those relations entailed the incorporation of Tibet into China. Tibet was not a part of China during the Mongol Empire and did not become a part of the Mongol-ruled Yuan Dynasty, as is often thought. The Mongols, of course, did exercise authority over the Tibetans, but they did so separately from their conquest and rule of China and never joined the two. Tibet was not ruled by the Chinese Ming Dynasty and was most certainly not incorporated into the Ming state. And the Manchu Qing's emperor relations with the Dalai Lamas and with Tibet also never resulted in Tibet's incorporation into China. The religio-political relations that did exist between uh, the Qing emperor and the Dalai Lama in Tibet, known in Tibetan as Chuyun relations, actually already explained uh, by Nirmal Sinha in his pioneering works in the 60s and 70s, need to be understood in the framework of the then applicable Tibetan Buddhist legal order and do not translate into modern day sovereignty relations. These conclusions are all corroborated in contemporaneous Mongolian, Manchu, Tibetan and Chinese sources and they are discussed in our book. Finally, the Republic of China, which unilaterally claimed Tibet as part of that republic from its inception, was entirely unable to establish any authority in or over Tibet, leaving its claim completely empty. In reality, Tibet was an independent state de facto and de jure throughout the Republic of China period, when the PRC was founded in 1949, and all the way up till the time that the People's Liberation Army invaded Tibet soon after. And this informs the nature of the Sino-Tibetan conflict. It informs also the legality of the PRC's presence in Tibet today and the obligations of both the PRC and the international community under international law today. So Tibet today is an occupied country and the Sino-Tibetan conflict is an international conflict and not China's internal affair. Contrary to what Beijing wants us to believe, the PRC's presence in Tibet is illegal because its armed invasion of Tibet in 1950 violated one of the most fundamental norms of modern international law the whole prohibition of the use of force against another state. The PRC has not acquired sovereignty over Tibet since its invasion and is obligated under international law to end its occupation of Tibet and to permit the Tibetans to freely exercise their full right to self-determination. But not only the PRC has obligations under international law, in fact, all states do. International law stipulates that all our governments have the duty not to recognize the illegal annexation of Tibet by China and not to cooperate with or assist Beijing in any way in maintaining its unlawful rule of Tibet. All states are also to refrain from aiding and abetting the exploitation of Tibet's natural resources without due permission of the Tibetans, since under international law, those resources belong solely to the Tibetan people. And in addition, our governments have the positive duty to help bring about an end to the occupation of Tibet and to permit and respect the Tibetan people's right to self-determination. 
But behaving accordingly is not only about upholding the rule of law. It is also a political and security imperative. Not speaking up about the illegality of China's occupation of Tibet and actions by governments that give credence to China's claim to sovereignty, such as statements acknowledging that Tibet is part of China, provide the PRC's claim and its presence in Tibet with a semblance of legitimacy. And this has tangible consequences today. In the first place, how the world's decision makers and influencers perceive the status of Tibet and act on that largely determines the prospect of China's leaders being motivated to negotiate with the Tibetans. The current attitude of appeasement, self-censorship and silence by the international community takes away all incentive for the PRC to negotiate with the Tibetans. Chinese leaders simply no longer feel the need to obtain legitimacy for the PRC's presence in Tibet from the Tibetans. Even the governments that have been most concerned about the situation in Tibet have relegated the issue of the realm of cultural and religious rights playing right into the PRC's strategy of casting Tibetans simply as one of its ethnic and religious minorities with no standing to even discuss the evolution of power. Secondly, regional peace and security are threatened by the international community's apathy. China's aggressive behavior towards India and Bhutan, its expansionism in the South China Sea, and its bullying and interference in Nepal, Mongolia, and in Southeast Asia, including Myanmar, all accompanied by a sense of entitlement, are, in my opinion, directly related to how the international community has treated and still treats China's invasion and occupation of Tibet. Beijing has learned that it can get away with territorial expansion over time if it consistently pushes a self-serving historical narrative and punishes those who challenge it. The historical narrative the PRC has propagated on Tibet is complicated and has created a sufficient mix of confusion, acceptance, self-censorship and silence to quell meaningful international questioning of its claim to sovereignty over Tibet and has also weakened the Tibetan movement itself. Beijing appears to be applying a similar strategy to prevent effective opposition to its occupation and militarization of islands in the South China Sea. And as for China's territorial claims in the Himalayas, these, of course, are directly tied to its claim and to its presence in Tibet. So let me therefore now turn to India. Today, the PRC claims large swaths of land in India's northeast and northwest. These claims led to war in 1962, and China's aggressive posture today is increasing tensions in India's northern borders. The validity of the PRC's sovereignty claim to parts of India is directly and solely tied to Beijing's claim to sovereignty over Tibet, and is therefore dependent on the same historical narrative we just discussed, and which we meticulously debunk in our book, by the way. China contends the parts of Ladakh and Sikkim and all of Arunachal Pradesh, which it calls South Tibet, belong to China, arguing that they historically belong to Tibet or were subject to Tibet's authority or influence. Because Tibet is and was historically a part of China, the argument runs, these territories are also Chinese, and the PRC has the right to exercise its sovereignty there. China makes a similar claim to a part of Bhutan. A rejection of China's claim to Tibet is, by its very nature, therefore, a rejection of its claim to Indian and Bhutanese territory. It is a clear and absolute argument. It is strong because it is grounded in the truth. In the case of Runachal Pradesh, the situation is particularly clear 
because that portion of the international boundary between India and Tibet was agreed upon between Tibet, Britain, uh, at Shimla in 1914. China refuses to accept that border because it contends that Tibet did not have the capacity to make treaties in 1914, since it was allegedly part of China. The Tibetan border with Arunachal Pradesh is legally firmly established as long as the Simla Agreement, which was explicitly confirmed by India upon its independence, stands. For India to take the position that Tibet is legally part of China today would imply one of two things. It would either imply that the government of India maintains that Tibet was already a part of China in 1914, which would invalidate India's claim to the borders established at Shimla and legitimize Beijing's claim to Arunachal Pradesh or parts of it. Or it implies that Although India considers the Shimla agreements as validly concluded, India recognizes as lawful the PRC's unlawful invasion and annexation of an independent Tibet 70 years ago, which squarely violates India's obligations under international law. As I see it, the self-censorship and silence on the illegitimacy of China's presence in Tibet that has become policy in many parts of the world, renders India highly vulnerable. It robs India of its strongest argument regarding its sovereign rights in Arunachal Pradesh and encourages the PRC to extend its historical narrative regarding Tibet to ethnically and culturally kindred regions all along the Himalayas. Let me then now come to the last part of my presentation and lay out a few ideas for the panel and perhaps also the audience to consider, critique, discuss, and hopefully build on. In order to achieve a negotiated resolution of the Sino-Tibetan conflict and end the occupation of Tibet, certain things need to be in place for which the international community's engagement is essential. In our book, we urge governments to course correct their Tibet and China policies, and we make nine general recommendations on how to do that. The engagement called for is entirely in line with the legal obligations and responsibilities of states. It does not constitute impermissible interference in the PRC's internal affairs, but it does require a significant course correct. I would like to mention two of these recommendations here. The first recommendation I'm hoping the panel can spend some time discussing concerns treating the situation in Tibet, Sino-Tibetan relations and the Sino-Tibetan conflict as falling squarely within the international communities and therefore every government's purview and responsibility and not as China's internal affair. Now, this requires using language, reflecting that consistently. It means referring to the Sino-Tibetan conflict as an international conflict and Tibet as an occupied country. Self-censoring, including in India and even among Tibetans to appease the Chinese, has resulted in the frequent use of euphemistic non-committal and even meaningless expressions such as the Tibet issue. This is not only not helpful, but it can be harmful. Our language must convey that we are dealing here with an unresolved international conflict, not a Chinese domestic matter. Beijing's terminology, including its reference to Tibetans as a minority instead of a people or nation, should also be avoided because such terminology reinforces the Chinese narrative and denies the Tibetan people its proper status and implicitly its right to self-determination. Treating the conflict as international also requires rejecting Beijing's, and I quote, core interest trap. And with it, the imposition by the PRC of rules of behavior 
that dictate what governments must believe, what their officials must say, and who they should or should not meet with and engage with. It requires also being guided instead by facts and law, including international legal principles and norms. And let me elaborate a little for those in the audience who may be less familiar with Beijing's core interest policy and what it means for governments around the world. China has designated Tibet, Taiwan, and Xinjiang as its core interests. It demands that its positions and interests regarding these regions must be accepted and respected by all governments as a prerequisite for friendly bilateral relations. Most recently, Beijing added South China Sea to its list of core interests. The Chinese, uses, the Chinese government uses this mechanism to instill fear of angering China and its officials, which has led many governments, in fact, to comply with its demands and to self censor It would seem to me that the Himalayan region, including specifically Tibet, Nepal, and Bhutan, is very much in India's core interest. So should India not consider publicly articulating this? This single act of articulating that Tibet and the Himalayan region is very much India's core interest would remove the Sino-Tibetan conflict from the exclusive ambit of PRC domestic affairs, as desired by Beijing, to the international political and legal arena where it belongs. It would at the same time relieve the pressure Beijing has been able to exert on many governments to remain silent on Tibet and to decline meeting with Tibetan leaders. Now, governments have an obligation under international law to help resolve the Sino-Tibetan conflict. If India were to publicly extend an open invitation to both parties in the conflict to meet and negotiate in India, or if it were to offer its mediation, facilitation, or good services, not only would Delhi be upholding the rule of law, it would send a signal to the entire international community that the conflict is not settled and remains a matter of international concern and responsibility. Of course, these and similar moves will anger Beijing and may provoke reactions. But this will happen precisely because they can be effective. China has not been punished for declaring the South China Sea its core interest or for incorporating Arunachal Pradesh in its maps. Nor is it too concerned about India's reaction to its own offer to mediate in the Indo-Pakistan conflict over Kashmir. Yet international policy on Tibet has been effectively stunted by most governments' fears of angering China's leaders. And needless to say, this is precisely the effect Beijing has sought to achieve. The second recommendation I would invite panel members to consider today is to actively counter the PRC's false and misleading historical narrative on Tibet, which is part of its annexation strategy. Importantly, as we saw, not contesting this narrative also has repercussions beyond Tibet, since it validates Beijing's territorial claims in northern India and makes it very hard to challenge related narratives deployed by Beijing to lay claim to other territories, such as those in the South China Sea. A simple way for India to contest China's narrative on Tibet is to make unambiguous reference to the validity of the Shimla agreements. India could do so by reiterating, republishing its position as stated in Pandit Nero's 1960 communication to the PRC, quoted in our book also. Doing so would be of critical importance also to India's Himalayan neighbors, whose borders are also being questioned by Beijing. I note that India has of recently no longer made statements under pressure from China that it recognizes Tibet to be an autonomous region of the PRC. 
And late last year, the US Department of State referred in a report to Tibet as being occupied, echoing earlier references to the illegal occupation of Tibet in US legislation. And these are important steps. But many governments continue to succumb to Chinese pressure to state that they consider Tibet to be a part of China. If they could be persuaded to stop doing so, this would strengthen India's position and give Sino-Tibetan conflict resolution efforts a fighting chance. Some people may feel that course correcting along these lines is not realistic. And some governments may fear retribution from Beijing. What is not realistic in my view is to maintain the present policy of appeasement and self-censorship on Tibet and to believe that this will somehow bring benefits to us or to the Tibetans. There may have been a time when pleasing China resulted in lucrative contracts or coveted loans, but the illusion of huge economic benefits has waned and been replaced by the realization that the price that we must pay for compliance with Beijing's demands is high. We have contributed not only to China's rise, but also to its bullying. And the only way to stop bullying is to no longer comply with the bully's demands. First and foremost, where those demands violate international norms and moral ones. This is finally starting to happen as governments push back on Chinese demands and pressure tactics. Let us make sure that this new tendency includes effective pushbacks on Tibet and increased pressure on Beijing to end its occupation and to negotiate a mutually beneficial and sustainable settlement with the Tibetans, and one which will also benefit India and its people. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, for uh, that very <coughs> succinct and very lucid uh, uh, you know, presentation of the arguments that you have uh, presented uh, in the book. Um, and you have, you have been very uh, clear about uh, you know, what the uh, legal position is and uh, what uh, needs to be uh, done uh, you know, going forward. Uh, like uh, many situations which we face, <laughs> you know, the legal situation sometimes is far more clear and far more well delineated, uh, but the political you know, situation is not so clear and not so well uh, delineated. And I think the challenge always is how do we find a link between what we see as the right you know, legal position and what the political uh, you know, sort of operation should be. Uh, and that will remain a, a challenge. But I would say that uh, from the perspective of uh, India, uh, one, uh, the reiteration of the Simla Agreement as the basis uh, for uh, the Sino-Indian boundary, I don't think that that is a issue because that has been our position right through that uh, it, it, it uh, derives from that uh, agreement. So. I, I think that is a line of argument which uh, certainly can be uh, followed through. Uh, I think there is there is a great deal which can be done in terms of you know uh, really uh, uh, contesting the Chinese narrative, historical narrative, uh, with respect to you know the the status of uh, uh, Tibet. Not just the status of Tibet, by the way, uh, but the status of uh, other <laughs> other territories uh, as well. So it need not be really limited to uh, Tibet. The third point I would like to make is that uh, there also needs to be some readjustment of the position of uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama and the uh, Tibetan, Tibetan uh, you know, parliament uh, here uh, in India, because uh, uh, as you will recall that uh, uh, His Holiness has in fact uh, stated quite uh, clearly that uh, he is no longer looking for independence, but he is looking for, you know, autonomy within within the ambit of, uh, you know, the Chinese constitution, which, uh, um, you know, that that concession has been made. <laughs> Some way must be found to, you know, sort of uh, sort of reverse that. Uh, that's not going to be uh, easy uh, easy uh, task. So this is a complex um, complex uh, issue, and I think. Uh, we will have to think through 
what is the best way to uh, take this uh, uh, forward. And even with respect to the historical uh, narrative, uh, I would just like to point out that, you know, uh, for quite some time, uh, when the British uh, were ruling uh, India, uh, there was this this uh, device of you know uh, conceding Chinese so uh, suzerainty, but not conceding sovereignty, uh, which was the not sustainable uh, to my mind uh, at all. I mean, the Chinese never accepted that in any case, but uh, we thought that this somehow could uh, be a amb ambiguity which we could live with, uh, that was not proved to be uh, possible. So I think uh, we also have to take into account the uh, consequences of that narrative. You know, how do we deal with that? As you remember, the David Miliband uh, of the uh, of uh, the UK uh, did make a statement, I think it was maybe 2008 or 2009, where he made a statement saying, yes. you know, uh, we accept uh, sovereignty. Uh, suzerainty was something you know that belonged to that geopolitical situation that geopolitical situation no longer holds uh, we we accept that tibet is a part of uh, china so there are these kind of challenges that uh, i think we will have to confront but thank you very much uh, for uh, giving us uh, uh, a very good uh, account of uh, what the legal position is and I think we will have to find a way in how 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 do we take this forward uh, as far as the politics is uh, concerned. Now, I believe that Kalki has to perhaps uh, leave a little early uh, because of her other commitments. So if um, I may uh, please, uh, uh, you know, uh, request our other panelists to let me give her the floor first. Uh, Kalki, um, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, and uh, we uh, very much look forward to listening to your reactions to what you have heard. Um, if you can limit yourself to about 10 minutes, that would be great. If you want to go a little beyond 10 minutes, uh, a few minutes extra, maybe that's okay. But uh, since we have several speakers, I hope uh, you can keep your remarks uh, somewhat brief. So, Palki, you have the floor. Yes, sir. I've been trained in television. We try to tell the story in one and a half minutes. So... <laughs> So I'll try to keep it longer. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you. Sure. sure. Uh, and uh, and thank you very much for, for having me here on this platform. And uh, it was very nice listening to uh, Dr. Michael Van Walt. Uh, they say that you cannot choose your neighbors. Uh, but in the case of India, I think India can make that choice. India can choose to not call China its neighbor. Uh, and, and insist that Tibet is the neighbor. And uh, while we've spoken about India's obligations and what more India can do, and, and I, I take those points uh, um, in the best spirit, I also want, want to say here that India has done more for Tibet than any other country in the world. And India has been instrumental in, uh, in Tibet's struggle for independence and self-determination. And that should always be underlined when we talk about India's role. Uh, countries at the end of the day are, are guided by national interest and they have to see, as uh, as Ambassador Sarun said, that uh, law is one thing, politics is quite another, and you have to find a way uh, to make all of it work. Last week, I spoke to Dr. Lobsang Sangye, who is the president of the Tibetan government in exile, and he pointed out something very interesting. He said that over the past few months, the debate in India has been over finger four and finger eight and, and this this mountain peak and that one. Uh, and it seems so small because you have allowed China to swallow the whole of Tibet and you're talking about which finger and, and which paw and so on. So it, it sometimes uh, feels weird to hear this discussion, but this is how we in the press, experts, policymakers, all of us refer to this as the Sino-India border and not the border with Tibet. So we probably can start with changing our, our, our language. Uh, here in beyond, we always call it the Wuhan virus. We get panned for it, but we want to always underline the fact that this is a virus that came out of Wuhan. So I think I think language and, and what, we, what we say and how we put something also makes uh, a lot of difference uh, in, in, in your positioning. Uh, the third thing that I agree with, of course, is that we all restrain ourselves. Uh, we all self-censor, and when we don't, then China finds a way to censor you. It happened last year in May when China also censored a friendship letter that the Europeans had written uh, for the Chinese government. They removed a full paragraph because they, it did not agree with them. So China knows how to censor, and other countries sort of uh, 
uh, tread on the eggshells and not try to upset uh, the Chinese sensibilities. But what about the sovereignty of other countries, including, if I may uh, go so far as to say that, what about uh, what about the one India policy? What about Gilgit Baltistan? All of those things, all of those questions will have to at some point be answered uh, by the policymakers in India. To what extent are you going to give the Chinese state uh, that that space to operate and respect their sensibilities uh, when they do not respect um, any sensibilities of others. The one point that I I've, I found very interesting is is the fact that the law is very clear, but at the same time China's record on uh, on not following the law is also very clear. You can keep throwing the rule book at the Chinese state. And they can keep telling you that it doesn't hold. I have a list of examples. The Hong Kong national security law is the latest one. It violates so many international conventions on human rights. And yet China has been allowed to go ahead with it. In 2016, when the ICJ ruled in favor of the Philippines, uh, the Chinese state called it null and void and devoid of any binding force. So you can say that this is a violation of international law. But but where does that take you? What does it change on the ground? That is something that we will have to at some point discuss when we when we talk about a country like China. Um, so the other thing that we always say is that even after this pandemic, if the world does not understand the need to make China pay, then they probably never will. Uh, in, in terms of forget the human human cost, the misery that it has caused us. This pandemic has cost, cost the world $16 trillion. And who is going to pay for that loss? And if countries cannot find common ground and a common purpose and a compelling enough purpose after this to hold the Chinese state accountable, I think nothing will. I don't think the suffering of the Tibetans will. I don't think the suffering of the, the Uyghurs will or, 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 or the very many uh, ethnic minorities that continue to suffer in China. Um, if if all of this, if this one year of of global suffering cannot change anything, then then nothing will. So uh, while we understand that there is a need to take on China, what is in it for the world? Now we have an answer to that. We do not want to suffer something that we did in 2020. Uh, wars do not are not won by rhetoric. There are a lot of policymakers and a lot of uh, uh, people who have uh, been actively involved in strategizing. And you would know that rhetoric is fine, but you need. You need strategy to win a war. So to say that we should call Tibet occupied or we should say this is, is basically not taking us very far. That's just poking China and then and then waiting to see what happens. And thankfully, we don't have Donald Trump in the White House anymore. So that's that policy of of dealing with the Chinese is gone with him. We will have to find a, a better uh, cohesive strategy uh, for for all the countries to find a common ground. You know, all we could do in the past one year was say that there should be an international investigation and look at what that investigation has led to. We have a WHO team being paraded by the Chinese in Wuhan and basically it's a um, it, it's it's a probe that is being controlled by them. The point I'm making is is very simple. While while the issue of Tibet is very important and in in the in the list of China's instances of cultural repression, Tibet perhaps is patient zero, as many have called it. Why has the world not done enough to deal with this? Why does the world remain silent? Because I think the world has not been able to come together and find a common framework. And we have all that we have in, in, in the name of one international body, the United Nations, which I'm sorry, has proven to be the most important body in the world. They can't seem to find uh, uh, find a way to deal with a country like China. So while we talk about law and while we talk about what ought to be done, uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Michael uh, Van Walt can probably also throw some light on how it should be done and how is it? How do you find a way for various countries and various powers to to come together and say, okay, this needs to be done, and this is going to be the cost of dealing with China in such and such fashion. But we will have to do it now, otherwise it will be too late. Uh, okay, Palki, thank you very much uh, uh, for your uh, comments and thank you very much for keeping within uh, within the time limit. You have been very, very disciplined. Thank you. Um, as you have uh, pointed out, uh, I, I think uh, reinforcing what I was also trying to, trying to put across that uh, it is uh, certainly uh, quite clear that the legal situation 
uh, supports <coughs> uh, you know Tibet, Tibet's independent status, uh, but there are a number of very naughty uh, you know uh, political issues uh, which also have to be uh, confronted. And I think we in this discussion uh, perhaps we can we can try and uh, look at some of those uh, aspects. Um, uh, as you said, um, you know unless we are able to get um, a, a, a group of countries, uh, major countries together to really uh, take a common stand. Um, you know, uh, it is difficult for uh, any particular country, no matter how powerful it is, to really stand out on this uh, on this uh, issue. And perhaps uh, what we also need to look at is, can we do this somewhat incrementally? I mean, there are various issues that we can pick up, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, then escalate it uh, in, in, in an incremental uh, fashion. Uh, there are ways in which we can we can uh, approach this once you once you decide that this is the strategy we need to uh, adopt. Uh, no doubt that uh, you know, as you said, uh, India and China did not have borders <laughs> except for a, a small bit uh, around uh, Xinjiang um, uh, for 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 centuries. It, our our uh, border was with uh, what was with uh, Tibet. Uh, so that's 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 also a reality, you know. Uh, that is something that we must uh, emphasize. Uh, uh, General Narasimhan, um, may I ask you to please uh, now take the floor and um, give us a sense uh, from your uh, perspective as to um, you know several very uh, um, specific recommendations have been made by uh, Michael with regard to uh, the legal situation. Uh, we are conscious of the fact that we also have to deal with uh, the political, uh, you know, aspect. Uh, given your experience uh, in the national security, the fact that you are heading, uh, you know, one of the most important, uh, you know, research uh, institutions uh, focusing on China. Uh, how do you see the situation? General Dan Simon, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. And I'll also be as short as uh, Palki was, if not uh, less. Uh, thank you very firstly, much. Thank you, thank you for uh, giving me this floor and giving me this opportunity. You know, like it has been brought out earlier, India has always steadfastly stood around, stood around the Shimla agreement as far as this boundary issue is concerned. On that, there has been no no doubts on this particular issue at all. But what uh, on the legal issues, I'm not going to make much of a comment, basically because the legal luminary like Michael has already done the need for. What I am trying to tell you is what China is doing a little more and what we need to be conscious of and what we need to take care of. One is on the three warfare strategy of China, legal warfare stands to be one of the major components of this particular issue. They create a legal kind of a background or a backing and a, and a kind of reasoning to support whatever they want to say. So recently, we, what we have noticed is there has been a tendency to discuss uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama's reincarnation within China. You find articles coming up, you find shows being uh, done on that. So what slowly is happening is that China is probably trying to push the envelope a little bit more on the issue of reincarnation. They also have enacted a law by which they say that this, the Chinese government has got the final say on, on the reincarnation issue. So slowly, I think they are also pushing the envelope a little bit more than slowly and steadily. The second issue that comes up is what Palki said. You can raise this legal issue, you can raise everything else, but what do you do with a person who doesn't actually react to that or reacts differently than how he's expected to react. For that, like Mr. Shamsharan said, however big a country may be, that will be very difficult to handle as a single country. You need to have more people coming in together to do this kind of a thing. The third point I wanted to uh, mention about that is, we need to increase the awareness of this particular issue in the people. When I say people only put into India or any other country, please understand that Ultimately, the, the people have to speak for this and therefore the study on Tibet, study on Tibetology, you would have seen in the recent uh, media reports that army is trying to uh, encourage the study on Tibetology, etc. So basically, we need to encourage people to study and people to come up with, with the correct understanding of Tibet, uh, Tibet per, per se. 
today it is extremely difficult to find anybody who knows even a decent amount about about tibet and the fourth point i want to say is as part of that pushing up uh, as part of this international uh, legal system you may pass judgments but how do you enforce them the enforcement capability of the international judiciary judicial system is something that you need to look at if that was existence then probably china won't be able to get away with the unclass decision that was given in 2016 so the strengthening of the legal implementation system of the judgments is something that we need to look into and lastly the point i say is like for example we may call out uh, legal issues we may call out anything else but ultimately we need to be sensitive to whatever is whatever we have to deal with that country on the on the on the border all other countries which deal with the situation or make statements etc do not have a boundary with india uh, with 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 uh, tibet or china and they also do not have a standing boundary dispute that is going on ever since the time that we became republics so the issue that comes up is we need to deal with this particular situation a little differently than others who do not have the boundary issue and other things that are going around I'll stop here and if there are any questions later i'll take it up thank you uh, general narsimhan uh, again thank you very much for uh, being very brief in your uh, in your <clears throat> uh uh i i think uh, you know uh, creating a kind of a alternative narrative uh is of value in itself uh and i think uh, michael has done a very good job in at least starting us off in constructing uh, that alternative narrative uh, a alternative narrative which uh, would be um, more more in a sense more uh, credible than what is being offered by uh, china i mean for example what he has uh, said about you know the uh, the rule over china by the mongols and by the by the uh, manchus uh, by the way there were also other you know semi nomadic tribes who also had uh, ruled over china or large parts of china uh, during certain parts of uh, you know history uh it, it's not as if he has pointed out <laughs> that it's not as if there is a continuous kind of a you know a chinese empire which has lasted uh, you know ever since the ever since the beginning of the christian era that is not the case i mean it is a it is a very complex dynamic that we see uh, in in history and perhaps uh, uh, bring that out uh, is something which uh, would help us a great deal in constructing that alternative uh, narrative and in which uh, you know tibet is very much a part i mean tibet uh, you know the tibetan empire in the in the um, during the thang time had actually you know devastated the chang uh, the thang capital and uh, in fact it was the it was the thang emperor who was paying tribute to the <laughs> to the tibetans i mean the whole role was completely reversed but those are you know just uh, just uh, you know wiped out from the historical record so i think uh, bringing those kind of aspects out in terms of constructing that uh, alternative narrative I, i think that itself would be a, a very very important uh, contribution so uh, that's uh, uh, general narsimha thank you for you know uh, giving giving some very specific suggestions as to what what we can do to take carry this uh, forward uh, may i now uh, uh, call upon our uh, next uh, speaker which is commodore uh, vasan who is from the uh, chennai center for chinese studies um, again someone who is very familiar uh, with china with china's uh, strategies has done a lot of work uh, on sino indian relations um you have heard uh, you know michael's uh, presentation you have heard what uh, your co panelists have had to uh, say uh, commodore vasan what is what is your view uh, with respect to how we take this forward uh, thank you thank ambassador you. and uh, hope you can hear me yes so, we can you? hear you thank you ambassador it's a great pleasure to see you in person so i met you long long ago and i am part of the ics group so i keep reading what you write i don't know it, it gives such great insights to our understanding of uh, sino uh, relations uh, now coming to this point i must also thank uh, mr krishan verma uh, for uh, you know inviting me to be on the panel and uh, he has also been uh, part of some of our initiatives recent initiatives so this is where uh, uh, you know our role to work together as think tanks 
uh, is important. Uh, I totally agree with uh, Dr. Michael's uh, wonderful work, you know, because it's taken more than 10 years to rectify. And the kind of work that's gone in tells us what kind of leads there are if the world is willing to take them out. You know, there have been no doubts about the legal uh, issues that is brought out, the role of international community, more specifically on the role of India. You know, what can India do is of greater importance to us today. Because, you know, within India, we've always had this debate of when can we use the Tibet card? Is it too late to use the Tibet card? You know, these questions have been asked every now and then, and, you know, we've not found the right answers because we are divided in our assessment of how China would react. This is again a folly on our part in my assessment because we've been too sensitive. Even Americans have acknowledged today that, uh, you know, it has with false hopes that they expect us not to integrate uh, with the global community. So they gave a lot of rope and unfortunately it does not happen. You know, rightly brought out by both General Nasiman as well as Palki, the fact that, uh, you know, they have scant regard for uh, UNCLOS and they are even willing to reject a complete PCA, which are issued by uh, uh, Hague, by the PCA. It's something which tells you that uh, they are not going to care for uh, legal issues or history for that matter. The entire South China Sea issue narrative has been uh, converted to their advantage to say it's all whatever is in the right dash line is mine. What I claim today is mine. What I have not claimed today is also mine. So this, you know, this is the kind of uh, approach that China has and they are use, willing to use muscle. So coming back to what India can do, I think uh, there's a good lead here in terms of what uh, Dr. Michael has uh, uh, prescribed and we need to take this up. We don't have to be defensive about how we deal with China. When have we seen China being defensive in the way they deal with India? You know, they had to uh, strike up an alliance with Pakistan or Bangladesh or Myanmar, but particularly a military alliance in Pakistan. They are not going to tell you that we are having this kind of a deal or a green submarines, missiles, etc. So I think we should come out of this self-imposed restriction or a restrictive regime and be a little more assertive, particularly, you know, armed with the kind of facts that have been given to us today. We need to get the international community on our side. We can't do it alone. You know, it is very clear. You know, uh, coincidentally, the Chennai Center for China Studies has a memorandum of understanding with the Tibet Policy Institute. You know, uh, we've done programs here, both in Dharamshala, and the team from uh, TPI has come down to Chennai, and we've had active association with them. I was very fortunate in uh, calling on uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama, and we spent more than an hour along with our researchers trying to understand what the narrative is. Like correctly brought out by uh, General Narasimhan as well as others, uh, Dalai Lama somehow, you know, seemed to convey that, uh, well, you know, we are part of uh, China, but we need uh, an autonomous region and we, we want independence in terms of our practices. So this perhaps will need to change. So we need to also talk to uh, His Holiness to say that these are the new findings. And for India, it's extremely important to push the boundaries out. We do not share boundary with China is the important message that we need to convey. And therefore, even if it is to apply a lot of pressure, we should not hesitate in applying this pressure. I would relate this to also the Quad. You know, a lot of people keep questioning as to what is the utility of Quad. I look at this as something that applies pressure on China and gives you a certain amount of momentum in the way you want to deal with them. Same is the case with BRI. Now, why did we abstain from BRI? So, you know, it's not that we let China get away with its narrative, with its aggressiveness, with its muscle flexing, and we need to make it very difficult for them, particularly with the kind of standoff that is taking place now. You know, we know that, uh, you know, for uh, nearly a year, we've been at the border. They would like to wear you out. They have the resources and they want India to break. And this is the time to, you know, have those points which will put them under pressure using the international community. We should use the law that has been issued by uh, USA, the Tibet law, you know, where, you know, the issue of incarnation came about. And uh, I think uh, Walki interviewed the, the prime minister in exile uh, day before yesterday and it, he came out clearly he said what is this issue about reincarnation we are getting these kind of restrictions from an atheist country let them first say that Mao can be reincarnated and you know then we will look at the issues related to the Lama's incarnation so I think they were quite clear and to say that just as in India where there's a legacy of uh, he quoted Shankaracharya for example he says you know it is the faith the people who belong to that faith who select the, the pontiff not an outside government. 
The Indian government does not select the Shankaracharya or Puri or wherever. So I think there are there is a new narrative that is developing. And from my point of view, uh, particularly people like Ambassador Shamsaran and uh, uh, you know our own General Nasiman, who are in the National Security Advisory Board, will need to change the narrative of how to deal with China. We don't have to be defensive at all. You know, like I said again and again, China is not worried about what your sensitivities are. You know, when they try and invest in the China POK economic corridor, he's not worried. He knows it's at best, in the worst case scenario, it's disputed, otherwise it belongs to India. But is he worried? So I think our effort should now be to use the study of Dr. Macken, give it a lot of publicity, have a lot more debate, and ensure that in the, you know, those in the corridors of power listen to these recommendations that have been viewed and open a new front. It's all about opening a new front just like the Quad. So we should not let go of this opportunity. We should cash on this moment that, you know, uh, uh, thanks to Dr. Michael, not that some of these were not known, but he's put it together and coming from a lawyer, it holds a lot of importance to us on how we can use some of the study material here and some of the findings and the recommendations for India in this manner. You know, I think also we've seen that slowly we are coming out of this kind of self-imposed restrictions. We did not hide the fact that we used the SFF, you know, in capturing some of the heights. This tells you that the Tibetan uh, movement was supported in India, you know, not just as refugees, but also in news uh, during liberation of Bangladesh. And over here, we made it quite public and say that we used the SFF and we acknowledged their sacrifice. So I think we need to change the narrative. We can't be in the same boat for uh, six, seven decades. Dr. Michael made another important point and he said, what is of importance, while everybody holds Nehru guilty of both in Kashmir and Tibet, he made an important observation about the 1960 communication that was sent to PRC. We need to take this forward and say, look, this is what we have always been saying. You know, and General Nassimhan spoke about the similar thing. But the point here is, we need to tell the Chinese that we now do not recognize the border as China's border. It's difficult, but achievable, provided you work on it, but get more people. We can't do it alone. India cannot do it alone. So let's get the United Nations. Let's get America. He's very active now. You know, they've even passed a law. So a nation that passes a law to support the Tibetans is something that we need to replicate here. Why are we fighting shy? You no, know, I know. So I'm sitting far away in Chennai. Therefore, I'm not under the <laughs> suffocating levels of pollution in uh, Delhi. And so therefore, perhaps I, I say what I'm saying. I think we need to get out of our defensive mode, move on, and make it very difficult for the Chinese to achieve their objective. Otherwise, we are surrendering. We are surrendering not physically, but we are surrendering in every sense of the word. And with that, I think I'll uh, you know, leave it open for questions. Uh, and that, that's my pitch. Thank you, sir, for this opportunity. Ambassador, sir, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna take your leave, sir, because I have a show to work on. Uh, yeah, well, thank you very much. You have been very kind to spend uh, time with us. We know that you are very busy with your uh, with your professional duties. So, uh, on behalf of all of us uh, present here, thank you very much uh, for uh, giving us your time. Thank Not you. At all. The pleasure is all mine. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, Parky, for your very thank very you. useful thank comment. You. I, and I, I will I will get into them, but unfortunately you won't be there to hear it. But maybe you can be. You, you I can will be I will listen to the conversation uh, that that followed after my exit. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, very much. And um, uh, yes, um, Commodore Watson, thank you very much for all your remarks. Uh, I would only say that uh, you know <laughs> there are many things that uh, you have mentioned we can do. Uh, but, you know, um, uh, power itself is an argument that uh, we must uh, always keep in mind. Uh, we should not uh, take steps which then end up uh, with uh, consequences which we cannot handle. Uh, so I think it is very important uh, whenever we do things of this kind or contemplate these kind of things, uh, we need to be also uh, somewhat uh, prudent, uh, somewhat, uh, you know, confident about our ability to handle uh, what the uh, consequence would be? Of course, there would be consequences. Uh, if we are if we are confident that we can handle handle those uh, consequences, fine. Uh, but uh, my sense is that uh, you know currently uh, the power situation, the power asymmetry between India and China is such that uh, perhaps <laughs> there may not be much um, 
much willingness to really uh, you know think along those lines at least at this point of time and with regard to you know mobilizing opinion amongst other countries i mean mention has been made of the united states mention has been made of the quad uh, i would like to remind you that in 1971 when or 72 i think when the us decided to um, uh, you know not contest china's return to the united nations and to the security council uh, i recall that you know we used to have a very major un program uh, to help uh, for the resettlement of uh, tibetans in india so that was quite a quite a big program that the un high commissioner for refugees had in india uh, with respect to uh, the tibetan refugees uh, as soon as that particular change came uh without any any kind of notice even uh the unhcr packed up its bag and left uh and of course i i think i i i would compliment our government for you know um, not not uh, you know sort of uh, reducing its support for the uh, tibetan refugees in india as a result of that but you can see how uh, changes in 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 geopolitics uh sometimes you know makes uh, you know these kind of changes uh you know very difficult to uh, handle so uh, i'm only cautioning that uh, what we may see as a certain position taken by the us today please do not forget that there was also a time <laughs> when it was a very different situation you know uh, uh with respect to uh, in uh, china us uh, relations things can change Uh, so i think in terms of trying to mobilize international opinion uh, let us try and see what are the ways in which uh, we can try and uh, get uh, a, a, some kind of a critical mass of support uh, for a for this uh, this uh, you know if there is a shift in policy uh, but also i think what we have to recognize is that you know uh, if i see for example uh, today Uh, the economic uh, argument has become very very important for two countries you know china is seen as the country which uh, is the only growth uh, engine for the global economy um, despite the fact that people are talking about you know uh, moving away supply chains away from china actually <laughs> many of those supply chains are being re reinforced uh, so the ground situation is uh, in fact moving in a direction that china is able to leverage for its own on uh, to its own advantage uh, so much of the aggressiveness much of the assertiveness we we see uh, on the part of china is related to its sense that it is today relatively speaking much more powerful much more important uh, for the economic interests of other countries and therefore you know um, uh, having having that kind of a pushback uh is is more difficult today than it was uh, uh what was before uh but we have to try and see how we can how we can uh, handle that situation uh kishan uh you are the last uh, panelist uh, you know for our for our uh, uh, interaction today uh you have the floor uh, and also maybe 10 minutes or uh, a little more if you would like and then i what i'll do is i will go back to michael uh he has heard uh, and will have heard you know the comments from various panelists uh, and uh, you know perhaps he would like to uh, give us a brief response to some of those uh, some of those comments and then i will open it out to question and answer so kishan you have the floor thank you thank you very much uh, <clears throat> what i had in mind really was uh, to change this uh, a little uh, the way we were going because i thought we, i i would like to focus more on what michael has written in his book and uh, how he has traced the history and given it uh, a legal uh, backing to his assertions that have been made through the thread of that book as to how uh, china could be challenged in terms of its uh, annexation of tibet how it has never actually uh, ever held sovereign rights over tibet uh, how uh, history evolved through the period Uh, where uh, they began to change the narrative and how people actually succumbed over a period of time for various reasons whether it was economic allurements whether it was political will uh, that we did change our positions very often let's 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 go back to the tibetan people who are at the at the base of all this uh, in right after 51 we had uh, no less than the his holiness dalai lama actually for for 10 years almost talking about independence of tibet 
and uh, he also gave this up after a while and we went into uh, the statement that he made in capitol hill in uh, in 87 and then in the strasbourg uh, european parliament where they talked about the middle way approach and the strategic autonomy uh, and you know a full autonomy preserving the culture the rights the language uh the traditions of of the tibetans so there was itself the tibetans himself uh gave the feeling i think uh, to people uh maybe it's just out of compulsion out of a sense of being repressed and uh, not many people coming to their sport uh to be to change uh their positions and they became a little more accommodative of the chinese and when they became more accommodative for the chinese i think the world also began to sort of recede in their support Uh, for this so i think we need to really go back into a little bit of how uh, china tibet relations uh, actually played out over the years over the last 60 or 70 years and to see the positions the tibetans took and whether now uh, i think it's a very timely book which and, and michael i think really puts out a tremendous amount of uh, uh, thought and facts out there in the open for people to uh, to to bite on to chew and actually try and see how we could take this narrative forward uh i think also there is an emphasis and in today's uh, talk and i i saw it uh, running right through uh, my previous uh, my previous panelists was that uh, we were talking more about india and what india could do uh, i would try to change this to say what can tibetans do what the, what can the cta do uh, what is what is uh, with the hisolians dalai lama who actually enjoys universal acceptance and love and 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 respect uh to be able to help uh, india and other countries to take the actual problems of the tibetans forward in what kind of forum should it be done how would it be done what kind of approaches could be made towards uh, sorting this problem out so i think the whole problem is a lot in implementation uh the other point i like to make also is about opinion uh you know michael is is an international jurist of great acclaim and i think he has been i think central figure in actually propagating the the tibetan problem i am not going to call it an issue michael because i think you are you are against that and i i agree with that it's not just an issue uh, it is a problem now uh, for for the chinese more than anybody else and for the tibetan people is to how do we i mean they could also bring out a contra opinion it's a legal opinion it's a legal uh, basis on which we are actually claiming uh, a certain position uh, in 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 the status of tibet uh what is the counter narrative and this is exactly what i want to ask michael how does he see somebody you know if he puts his the other hat on and says okay now how will china counter these is it only by saying that well i i took them on and i had a, a 17 point agreement and that's it and that therefore the debate is mine and then some countries have actually been forced uh and coerced into accepting that position i mean a powerful country why india uh, uk as you said uh, very rightly um, as mrs mentioned about miliband i said he, the us did it the french did it uh, there were a lot of you know p5 countries who actually acquiesced in 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 calling uh, uh, tibet uh, uh, as part of china and china having sovereign rights over tibet and exercising full sovereign so how do we go forward where what could be the chinese push back to these things having you know these are all historical facts So how do we counter that? How and and isn't China on a better wicket today to be able to push back? Uh, you did mention, uh, Ambassador Sir, and you did mention, Sir, about the economic power, uh, the the military power that they exercise, the kind of uh, propaganda outreach that they have made over the years to be able to push their narrative and quell, or in fact, uh, stifle the voice of dissent or the voice of uh, contradiction to their, their thinking. so how do we tackle it is my question rather than trying to say that all right what should india do i mean india india will do what it what it has to and it, india has been doing and i think uh, it's been acknowledged uh, by everybody including the people who matter most which is the tibetans themselves who have always looked up to uh, to india and i think india has responded as best as it could and i think you have rightfully said we could have done a little more there's no doubt about it uh, we could still be more assertive even today i agree with uh, with the the fact that we really need to re- look at the tibetan policy all over again and not only tibet uh, you, there was a mention about why not xinjiang why not taiwan why not uh, in mongolia for that matter i think we should be looking at all these places and seeing whether there is a case that we could actually bring out and defend our own interests by actually finding vulnerabilities in the chinese system and going and taking the problem to them rather than being defensive or being just bilateral 
uh, we are seeing them making uh, inroads into Ladakh. Uh, they have again uh, paid, you know, uh, short shift to uh, to the policies and treaties and protocols that we have uh, agreed with them over the years. Uh, why are we sticking uh, to to law uh, absolutely so faithfully that we are losing our own territorial, our own sovereignty, our own land and territories uh, by by the encroachment? And I'm not referring only to Ladakh. Uh, I'm talking about POK. You, you know, and Gilgit Baltistan. These are issues that they are that they are extending it to. And why are we letting them happen, go through with this? So I would like to ask this question uh, more from Michael as to does he have answers to this in his book? Uh, and, and can we? How do we take this book forward? How do we take the the these these suggestions and the recommendation that he has made uh, forward? He has uh, in the last part where he men mentioned these nine recommendations. He has given a very general overview as to what countries could do, and I can see the as the sense of that because you cannot really uh, in a in a published uh, book actually say so and so should do this or that. So it would be it would be I think uh, uh, rather uh, you know uh, uh, using the Chinese word a little bit of a hegemonic act to be able to say that. So I wouldn't I wouldn't say that. But uh, can you can he uh, and this is Michael uh, I'm asking you this question is. How do we take these things forward uh, in uh, other than just a, 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 a sort of concert of democracies uh, taking uh, this this uh, Tibet issue and putting it back on the table? Uh, so I'm looking at a bilateral, I'm looking at a regional, and I'm looking more at a global in these three areas. How do we take this thing forward? Because I think there is there's some fascinating insights in the 2020 brief. Uh, let me stop here and I push it back to uh, Michael uh, if you could uh, respond to these and then maybe I could come back with a couple of more questions. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, um, Kishan, for those remarks and uh, yeah, for bringing back the discussion to you know the propositions uh, in Michael's uh, book. Uh, as I said, um, you know, uh, we have now had uh, a whole series of uh, comments from our uh, distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, Michael, um, I would uh, turn the floor to you to please uh, respond to some of the uh, questions which have been raised, to some of the comments which have been uh, made. Uh, if you can please do this in the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes, uh, that would still give us you know, another 10 to 15 minutes to uh, take up some questions and answers. Uh, so, um, yeah, Michael, you have the floor now. Thank you so much, Amitabha. Um... And thank you for your comments and, and those of all the other uh, distinguished panelists, um, all of which are, are not only right on point, but also I think useful as a, as a way to, um, to continue the conversation. Um, first, uh, I think one point that was made uh, um, by, uh, actually many of the points were made by many of you. So. I, I probably don't actually need to respond individually to different panelists because many uh, of them. No, there is no need to respond to each one uh, individually. Please just make your comments with regard to whatever issues have been raised. Yes. Um, regarding intro, uh, there is no question that that uh, India has been the country that has done the most. Um, both in terms of uh, the concrete work that India has done to help Tibetan refugees, to create the possibility for Tibetans to establish their um, their government in in exile, uh, whether or not it is it is formally called a government in exile, but an administration in exile that can carry forward um, not only. Uh, taking care of the of the uh, refugees in India and in the diaspora, but also uh, carrying forward for their their cause. And this is um, this has been a very courageous act for a country to take when it has, as you've pointed out very clearly, a border with uh, such a giant um, uh, and and border issues and and uh, is has been put under a lot of pressure. So there is no question that, that India has done a tremendous amount. Um, and my comments directed to India um, were obviously because this webinar um, is, is taking place in India or from India, and also because I had the opportunity um, this time to speak to so many of you that 
that can influence the way in which things are done in India. Um, and, and because I wish to push a little bit, a little bit beyond the, uh, the boundaries that we're used to discussing. Um, so that is the spirit of, uh, of, the, the, uh, of my comments in relation to India in particular. Um, uh, language, uh, the points I make on language and those uh, are also included in the general recommendations that we just talked about that are uh, in the last portion of the book. Um, that is not the answer, obviously, but it is, I think, a, um, a very important first step is to um, become conscious again of the, the way in which we use language when we talk about Tibet, when we talk about Tibetans, uh, so that we're not reinforcing China's narrative, but we're in fact challenging it simply by the language that we use. Um, it is very difficult to, to challenge China's narrative if, while we do it, we use their terminology that has political and legal consequences. Um, so I think that, that, that the way in which we use language uh, in this issue is, is important, and, uh, but again, as, a, as, as a, a step in the right direction, not as a solution in and of itself. Um, uh, reference has been made to the, and I think that it is very important, um, and uh, Mr. Krishan Varma also pointed this out, that we, we need to uh, look also at the Tibetan positions and how they have moved over time and what effect that has had on um, other members of the international community. And I think it has had a big effect. I think that that the fact that um, His Holiness and uh, the CTA um, expressed their preparedness to accept a form of genuine autonomy um, as part of an agreement uh, that they would be willing to negotiate with the PRC uh, has shifted the positions of a number of people, a number of politicians in different places in the world who have eagerly um, <clears throat> taken this on and said, or have, have interpreted as meaning, uh, well, then maybe we don't need to, to, to push uh, China on, on its narrative. We may need, not need to challenge China's legitimacy in Tibet because His Holiness is saying he's prepared to accept genuine autonomy. Here, I think that the distinction needs to be made between having made a concession uh, and expressing a preparedness to negotiate on it. Um, I think the, the, as I understand it, um, the Tibetan position has been, if we, we are prepared to negotiate a package that would include us accepting a form of genuine autonomy within the framework of the PRC constitution. Um, but of course, only contingent upon China's accepting um, uh, to, to grant and respect that autonomy. Um, and that does not mean that uh, His Holiness or uh, the CTA has accepted that Tibet is part of China or has accepted that Tibet is an autonomous region of China. It has accepted to negotiate a deal where it would make a huge compromise which would be to give up its right to independence in exchange for a solid and robust autonomy that China would be made to respect. Um, so far, China has not accepted it, has not accepted to even negotiate about it. And so I don't, uh, uh, and so I think it is important to, to um, for Tibetans to, um, reiterate their rights, to reiterate their um, uh, the nature of, uh, of, of the conflict uh, and where they, what their starting point is for negotiations. That they have a right to independence, they're willing to 
make a concession and not that they are autonomous and they're just trying to ask for a little bit more autonomy. Um, um, yes, and and of course the main the main question and the main issues that were raised um, is the you know one can have uh, a, a, a good legal arguments one can one can present a narrative that that works but power relations are the key and how can you work uh, how can you work with that. Um, um, so, I agree that one of the, uh, and this is what we're trying to push with the book, is a first step is, or an important step in any strategy, um, has to be to um, present, promote um, a convincing, um, a convincing narrative, a convincing argument. Um, and because the argument that that uh, the Tibetans have on their side um, and the one that we've tried to present in the book is based on a um, on truth. It is based on an analysis of the history. It's based on an analysis of how you then apply uh, legal norms and moral norms to it. Um, that that narrative, which is an alternative to China's narrative, I think needs to be presented, needs to be diffused, needs to be used, not just read, but really needs to be used. Um, and achieving something concrete is, um, is I agree, only going to be possible with international cooperation. In other words, um, uh, um, China has been extremely good at um, dealing with countries individually. Um, we've seen that in Europe very clearly, whereas Europe could have taken for a long time already a, a, a joint position vis-a-vis uh, -vis China on many issues, but also on Tibet. Um, China has been able to pick out individual countries, put them under pressure, and not make it possible for the European Union to, to create a common policy. They've only started doing that very recently um, and not, uh, not fully either. Um, and China does this elsewhere as well. So the only way to respond to that um, on Tibet and on other issues is for cooperation among various countries that that feel they have a common interest, um, that feel they have a common purpose in uh, in advancing a particular agenda, in our case, uh, the Tibet agenda, um, but as, as was mentioned as well, uh, issues relating to the Uyghurs, uh, Hong Kong, etc., uh, are all um, issues where common interests could be found among many members of the international community. India, because of its location, but also because of its uh, history um, with Tibet uh, and with China, is um, looked looked at, uh, looked up to um, as a country that has a potential to provide leadership in this. And I don't mean necessarily um, and and open and um, demonstrative leadership, uh, because I know that, that exactly that makes India vulnerable to, to uh, um, repercussions from China if it stands there alone, trying to lead a group that is maybe not immediately supporting it. Um, but I believe that that just as we saw in the early days in the, in the discussions at the United Nations on Tibet, countries were looking to India to see what India thought, um, first of all, before they took a position or before they took a position that might put them out on a limb. And so I believe that, that India's role could be 
um, behind the scenes, um, encouraging uh, other countries to to work towards some type of consensus and some type of um, policy that would work. Um, India um, uh, India could encourage other countries to to challenge the narrative that China uh, presents rather than acquiesce in it. Um, and India could encourage other countries to stop uh, uh, giving this alternative uh, to legitimacy to China. Uh, and by that I mean, uh, and you've pointed it out, that a number of countries still make these statements that they believe that Tibet is part of China. A completely gratuitous, uh, unnecessary statement uh, which is repeated like a mantra every time that China puts pressure on the country to repeat it in a way that I don't think any country requires of any other country that they do that about a piece of their territory. It's, it's a fairly unusual practice of China and other countries seem to comply without, without um, being even embarrassed by doing so. So um, uh, I think these are, again, they're not a solution and a strategy needs to be worked out and needs to be worked out among countries. But I think all these are first steps where in which um, an Indian role can be very important. I mean, I'm still, I'm still, uh, and this is part of the reason why I, uh, um, why we decided to, to work on this. Um, I'm shocked very often when I go to foreign ministries in, in a number of countries um, where very well informed foreign ministry officials who um, are China specialists or have worked in China or have been diplomats there um, tend to believe at least part of the Chinese narrative on Tibet. Uh, sufficiently so that they really doubt uh, whether Tibet was or was not a part of China. They, 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 there probably is some truth in what the Chinese say. Sufficiently so that that leads them not to challenge it, not even in a private conversation. Um, I'm not saying everybody does that, but there are too many um, people in, in positions that really matter in terms of China policy that have somehow accepted that China's narrative may have some validity to it. And so this is why I think, again, a, a first step or one of the first steps is to really challenge it. Um, and here India has, an, uh, again, I think a possible role of encouraging um, their colleagues, Indian diplomats, their colleagues uh, among other diplomats um, and uh, the Indian government with other governments to encourage them not to gratuitously uh, make these statements uh, in favor of China, not to make statements, for example, that, Tibet, that they are against um, Tibet being independent or that they oppose Tibetan independence, which again is a completely unnecessary statement to make um, and violates the rights of the Tibetans to decide for themselves. Um, so it is, it is uh, as a first step, as a first uh, a group of steps, uh, let us um, no longer go along with the Chinese narrative. Let us challenge the Chinese narrative. Let us present, as you said, an alternative um, uh, narrative that is based on true truth. And law can be used and should be used as an instrument to bolster those arguments, to bolster your policies. Um, and even whether China respects it or not, whether China uh, complies with the law or not, speaking out uh, in terms of what is China's obligation, what are the obligations of other states, what is the legal position in terms of China's um, rule in Tibet, uh, the illegitimacy of its presence in Tibet. Um, I think all of that, um, by speaking out on it, it will encourage others to take up the issue. It will uh, legitimize 
the ability of parliamentarians, of NGOs, of uh, government officials ultimately to take a position when they believe that it is the right time to do so um, because they will have built the legal case for it simply by speaking about it or encouraging others to speak about it or encouraging even private persons um, and, and organizations uh, and again I emphasize and parliamentarians to speak out on the issue. Once the groundwork has been done and there's an understanding um, of this alternative narrative, uh, an understanding of how that <coughs> affects the rights of the Tibetans and the uh, illegitimacy of China's position in Tibet, then I think taking uh, new policy steps by various governments in concert can have an impact. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael. I think uh, you have, uh, you know, uh, responded to several of the uh, points which have been uh, raised. Um, you know, I think the first order of business is, uh, you know, if uh, uh, since this is ultimately about Tibet and Tibetan people, uh, I think the first order of business is that uh, uh, if there could be a very clear position that although an offer was made, about uh, you know autonomy for uh, Tibet within the uh, Chinese uh, uh, framework of the Chinese constitution, <coughs> China has not lived up to this. China has you know not uh, in fact uh, responded positively to this. Uh, therefore, there is sufficient reason uh, to go back to uh, the position that only an independent Tibet uh, could really meet the aspirations of the people of Tibet. Uh, I think if that uh, is the starting point, then you will perhaps begin to see uh, a certain certain different uh, kind of narrative, uh, you know, emerging, or at least creating the creating the basis for a, uh, a another narrative. And I think it is also perhaps worthwhile to look at what can be done, even if it is not at the level of governments to begin with. What can be done at the academic level, at the civil society level, uh, to really highlight uh, some of the very interesting points that you have made about the history part, uh, you know, about uh, the status of Tibet through history. I think uh, there is certainly no limit on what can be done on the academic side, what can be done on the civil society side. Uh, even if we can't do this immediately uh, as far as the uh, as far as governments are concerned, because if the government see that there is that kind of upsurge of opinion, uh, then perhaps they would also be able to able to, uh, you know, take that into account. Uh, so I have just 15 minutes left now. Uh, so I would open the floor to uh, questions. What I will do is let me take uh, two or three uh, questions uh, together. Uh, please let us know who you want uh, this question to be answered. I presume that you would still like to pose certain um, questions to uh, uh, Michael if you want to do that, or, or you want to make a short comment, uh, please uh, do that as well. But please keep yourself very brief because uh, we don't have very much uh, time. Um, anyone who would like to speak, I think there is uh, uh, Major General B.K. Sharma who asked for a few minutes to talk about uh, you know uh, his his experience with uh, tibet would you like to uh, perhaps uh, take the floor and uh, then i will come to general mehta uh, thank you very much sir i, I shall be very brief uh, it is based on my visit to tibet last to last year where i spent about uh, 7 days and from my perspective what i feel that next one decade is highly critical for whatever position we want to take on Tibet. Uh, Chinese are going to be more and more intrusive as far as Kashmir is concerned. And therefore, sooner or later, we'll have to give more traction to a uh, one China policy vis-a-vis -vis one India policy, that kind of a quid pro quo from them. But if you look at the sweeping changes that are taking place in Tibet, they are mind boggling. I visited all their monasteries, the countryside, some of these model houses and all, and there is a profound socio, uh, social re-engineering which is taking place, whether it is the nomadic way of life, whether it is uh, management of the monasteries by the hands, 
whether it is you know changing the social behavior of this youth thereby you know inducting them to inducing them to the universal education system and imbibing lamaism only at the age of about 18 years by then you know that spark in him is gone all those changes are very rapidly taking place but not withstanding that the positive issue is that bulk of the tibetans still look at india as a spiritual mentor and there is lot of appeal for india there now what india needs to do among other things is i feel that we need to create a department of himalayan affairs here which actually starts you know looking at cross domain expertise on tibet not only in india but in the entire himalayan belt and give more support to the central tip administration which is in in dharamsala also we need to take a better care of our tibetan diaspora because a large number of them are actually living in india for better prospects outside india and another issue that i feel is that now we have also this sff about 7 8 battalions here and they done a wonderful job as we know in the on the kalash ranges how do we sort of keep them in good health and uh, operate maintain their operational effectiveness and last thing that i think which is going to be a tipping point is is the succession of his holiness dalai lama here not only in india but with the entire buddhist circuit which is an our strategic neighborhood i think we need to go on an diplomatic overdrive and build some kind of a consensus so that there is a larger appeal in the buddhist population to accept uh, the success such success of the lai lama and not be led by the chinese narrative these are some of the points that i thought yeah. i'll put it across sir okay thank you very much uh, i think very useful suggestions by the way uh, we had been talking about you know uh, this uh, having a A, a university for Himalayan studies for several years now. The government uh, simply has not responded. Uh, we have been talking about you know how we should have uh, uh, broadcasting uh, along the uh, border because uh, you know after all we have also uh, Tibetan uh, ethnic Tibetans within India, not necessarily only refugees. Uh, so we could have uh, you know a. a A, 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 a broadcast program tv programs that would uh, not only um, not only impact uh, their opinion but also across uh, the border but uh, unfortunately many of these uh, proposals have not been uh, been uh, followed up so that is something that we have to look at uh, we have the uh, institute for tibetan studies also in um, in sarnath which has been doing excellent work the kind of narrative that we are talking about the history that we are talking about the kind of knowledge that you have at that center is is tremendous i have seen some of the work that they have done but you know there is no uh, system in india to give it uh, as the the kind of play that uh, it should have you know so it remains uh, like a academic <laughs> study within that center uh, it doesn't really uh, come out uh, and and influence opinion yeah even uh, you know well educated indians i don't think uh, know very much about tibetan uh, history and the importance of uh, you know uh, tibetan uh, culture it is a very very rich culture it is something which also is uh, a matter of great pride for india to have that as part of our uh, culture but you know somehow it it's 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 not quite made the kind of impact that uh, it it uh, should have um uh, general mehta uh, your comment please and please if you can be brief uh, because we have a few others who would like to speak as well go ahead general mehta General Mehta, you will have to unmute yourself. Am I audible now? Now you are audible. Okay, thank you, thank, thank, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, very, very quickly, I think uh, we have a a very good case, um, which uh, Doctor Michael Van Waltz has presented, and I have. Uh, I think this is the second or third time I am listening to him. 
uh, um, on his case. Um, the argument now is uh, whether and how to take this forward. You know, people are still debating for the last 10 years. We've been wondering when and how to take this Tibet issue forward. Today, the Chinese are at their aggressive and assertive best. The whole international community, and I'm talking about the timing of taking up this case. Today, the entire or almost the entire international community is, is one on the same platform pointing out to China's aggression and being a bully. So I don't think you will get a better time to do it. The point made about who will do, who will bell the cat, I think obviously we have named it, it's Tibet and India, and they are interconnected. So how do we connect India and Tibet? And the last thing, the third point is, the consequences that uh, Ambassador Saran talked about, I think uh, these can be considered by the Ministry of External Affairs, by the Ministry of Defense and the, the Military Operations Directorate. I am sure that if we keep vacillating on this issue, we will never, we will have a case I think we have a case and we have we have a timing for it. It's an opportune moment. We should now think about how do we implement this and the consequential repercussions of this on, well, not on Tibet so much as it will be on India. And the very last point is that the key player besides India, of course, is the United States. And unless we can get a, bi an, a, a bipartisan support on Tibet, and we've seen a number of steps that have been taken recently by the United States, and India and the US have a two, two plus two uh, dialogue, we should include the Tibet issue at an opportune time. And that opportune time is this year. We should not keep saying, when are we going to do it? We have to decide on this. And this can be done incrementally. Give a Bharat Ratna to the Dalai Lama. Call the road the Dalai Lama road. There are a number of ideas that people have. And I'm sure these can be implemented. But let's make a start. Unless yeah. we make a start and we've we keep just worrying about, oh, what will what will the Chinese do? The Chinese don't worry about this. Yes, there is power asymmetry, but let's handle the consequences and the repercussions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I have two last questions. Uh, one is from um, Dolkun Isa and then Mr. Tenzin Sundev. They, these will be the two last questions. So, Mr. Dolkun Isa, would you like to please take the floor and uh, uh, and say a few words? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, give me this opportunity. First, uh, thank you very much the Foundation for Nonviolent Alternative organized this event. Uh, and uh, today I'm so happy to meet uh, some of our uh, similar face, good friends, uh, Michael Fanwald. And uh, thanks, you uh, did very excellent presentation. And also, in the August, uh, I was the host and the, by the foundation and the attending uh, sharing site panel, Mr. Christian Varma. I'm so happy to uh, see uh, you today here. My, uh, you know, is that uh, Michael already explained that Tibet situation, the Tibet is occupied countries uh, and uh, never part of China, but China all the time uh, claim is the Tibet in East Turkestan and uh, all is the part of China from the ancient, ancient, ancient time. Uh, and uh, actually, we believe China know today. China also threaten the India uh, sovereignty as well. Uh, actually, we believe it is the reality. There is no uh, border between direct border China and the, uh, India. The India ha has a 
border with Turkestan and Tibet. But China is all the time saying it's a part of China, Tibet, and you know, Turkestan. Uh, and the India since the uh, 60 years and the hosted was the Tibetan uh, people, Holmes Dalai Lama. Uh, and uh, but I regularly attend the UN meeting and uh, some other international bodies meetings. I'm one thing that I really don't understand. You know, no, it is the India media, India people, and so very involved in Uyghur genocide. I personally in the attending so many uh, webinar and so many India media have an interview, had an interview with me, some other Uyghur activists every day nearly. India people, India media is very involved in this. But I haven't seen any uh, any concrete and this uh, voice from the India government, not only for the Uyghur issue, even Tibetan issues. So for example, UN Human Rights Council sections. Some other UN section, most of the time, India government is very caution and silent. Because go India is, I believe, this is the, one of the largest democratic nations uh, around the world and the model of the, uh, the democracy in the Asia, mostly. But for the uh, human rights violation, or even today, is the Chinese government commit genocide against the Uyghur. This is the UN, uh, United States, Pompeo and the uh, decorate official, this is a genocide. Uh, and the uh, uh, cultural genocide was happening in the Tibetan since the money years. But still, India government understand, India people understand very well, particularly Tibet issue. And recently is very similar Uyghur issue as well. But so far, India government all the time uh, uh, silence. Why? What is the reason? This is really to understand, to uh, hard understand to, uh, uh, to the silence. Uh, what is the reason there is, I have seen several uh, former member of security uh, advisor, for example, uh, Nara Shiham and the Varma uh, may, and the Michael is uh, maybe one of you all, uh, if you can uh, give you, can you, your answer, your view on this, I'm very happy. Thank you. Ambassador Sharan, are you there? Zenzin, please, um, please uh, take the floor. Yes. Yours uh, is the last question. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity. I've read Michael Wenwald from my school time. I'm a Tibetan refugee living in Dharamchala today. Uh, I'm a writer and activist. Um, so I think the the main problem india is facing is india got the china narrative wrong india inherited uh, the british version that has considered manchus as china manchus ruled over china till 1911 and only in 1911 the real china emerged as a free and independent country now if you accept manchus as china then and, you know, uh, India will continue to face problems about the Galwan Valley because um, the Man Tibet had some kind of influence, not occupation, not uh, uh, complete under control. But so that kind of influence, uh, uh, India then had to concede. Uh, same thing happened during the uh, Galwan Valley. So therefore, once you accept the Manchu as China, uh, then India loses their kind of uh, uh, historical uh, documentational evidences to talk about Tibet, East Turkestan, Southern Mongolia and Manchuria itself. So India must look at China as a new and independent country only from 1911. That should be the correct narrative. Otherwise, uh, many of the other issues they may may uh, get be floored. This okay. is what I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay. Okay. The fact is that uh, even after 1911, if you look at the you know the Shanghai Sheikh government, uh, they never accepted uh, that there was suzerainty over Tibet. They always, in fact. Uh, asserted that they had sovereignty over Tibet. Uh, so it was not as if uh, there was any change 
uh, in the position with respect to the Republican government. So that this brings us to the end of our um, of our interaction uh, this evening. Um, is Michael still there? Uh, Michael, um, uh, if, did, did you want to uh, uh, in, uh, respond with uh, maybe just two minutes? I can't give you more time. But would you like to say a few last words? Uh, I would like to echo uh, General Mehta's point that this is um, an unusually good time to try to create some consensus among some like-minded governments around the world to uh, take some meaningful action um, in relation to Tibet and, uh, of course, in relation to the uh, to East Turkestan, to the Uyghurs uh, and what is going on there um, and other related issues, um, aggressive policies by China and their behavior uh, towards India. Uh, towards countries bordering the South China Sea, um, uh, etc. So, just to 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 agree with the point that it is now uh, for the first time in in many many years that there is a general uh, feeling of discomfort with the way China is behaving, putting it very mildly and a willingness to push back. We okay. see it in Europe, we see it in um, uh, Southeast Asia, we see it in South Asia, uh, we see it clearly in the US, um, in the Pacific. There are many uh, countries that whether they openly react or not, are willing to support efforts to reign in China. Um, and if one is able to uh, to use moral, legal, and political arguments jointly uh, to create some type of consensus among some of these countries on areas where a pushback would be effective, uh, would be um, beneficial to Tibetans uh, and uh, beneficial to India and the Indian people, I think this is the best time to do it. Okay. Okay, so on that uh, note, that uh, we are <laughs> at a at a very propitious time to uh, revisit uh, this uh, issue, and several very interesting ideas have been thrown up, uh, both with respect to what uh, our Tibetan friends themselves need to do and uh, what India can do in order to really put this back on the international agenda. Um, thank you very much, all our very distinguished uh, panelists. I would like to thank the Foundation for Non-Violent uh, uh, Alternatives uh, for taking the initiative to organize this. Um, thank you, Kishan. Thank you, Raybon, uh, for bringing us uh, together. And uh, thank you very much, Michael, for um, you know giving us um, this opportunity to really look at uh, some of the very interesting work that you have done over the last decade or so. Uh, you know, bringing, marshalling all these very uh, important arguments, giving us a sense of uh, the the real history in terms of the uh, status of Tibet. Um, I do hope that, uh, you know, on the basis of this uh, uh, very interesting discussion we have had, uh, we can perhaps, uh, you know, really set the ball rolling uh, with respect to uh, a different kind of uh, narrative. Uh, that needs to be that needs to be put in place. So, uh, good evening to everyone again. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, may I just add just one uh, sentence? Uh, I just want to thank uh, Michael personally uh, for giving FNWA the uh, privilege and the honor to be the ones uh, to actually discuss his book, uh, which has been launched only recently abroad uh on our platform uh, thank you very much for sharing it sir uh, for the session and uh, for your insightful remarks and i think we are going back home with something to think about in terms of implementation of what he has said in the book thank you sir okay yeah, thank you good night thank you good night sir good night thank you good night good night, good night. Good night. Bye.